whether that's possible. It's also important to see that the majority minority issue is, is, a, is, is a flexible dynamic shifting one because sometimes for the claims, for example, of religious minorities, some deeply religious members of a majority have a better understanding for their claims than others. So sometimes rather conservative Christians do understand the importance of a headscarf uh, um, and do actually support uh, uh, these claims, whereas um, some more you know, liberal-minded people and especially some uh, feminist-oriented uh, critics say, okay, you know, uh, that headscarf issue is a touchy issue. Uh, and we do reproduce here gender stereotypes in families, which we don't want. So the alliances form, uh, change, it's complicated. Um, and so uh, the best thing we can hope for is a democratic culture in which these things um, uh, come up, in which they are dealt with. Um, well, they will always be dealt with polemically, but at least if it is, you ought to have media uh, in which uh, minorities have a chance uh, to raise their voice um, and, make, and make themselves heard um, and not have to go to the streets, even though sometimes demonstrations and public acts of, um, of protest might be necessary too. We have another question. Could I ask you to introduce yourself? I'm Shmuel Wilner. I'm one of the uh, students of this uh, of tolerance here. Um, so with regards to your paradoxes and your unraveling of the paradoxes, um, so racism, um, don't take this the wrong way, uh, seems to be low-hanging fruit um, with regards to this particular objection. So is there a list of, uh, of uh, things that would be viewed as we should not tolerate? You know, is there a list and who would create that list of things that are intolerable? And then also, with regards to Paradox 2, um, which also, I guess you said, should be rejected fundamentally, um, do we get to a sense of moral absolutism somewhere there, or? All right. Intolerable are beliefs and practices which deny equal respect to others. That can be racist beliefs, it can be beliefs of, of, other, of another nature. Uh, some might have a religious background, some have other, back, other backgrounds. So in a democratic society, well in any society, denying equal standing to others uh, ought not to be tolerated because that's the precondition for a mutual scheme of toleration. When I say ought not to be tolerated, what this then means is another issue. Whether we ban certain languages, we ban parties, groups from public or political life, these are all difficult issues. And sometimes in the German context, for example, there's now a new attempt um, to ban a fascist party. It has failed years ago uh, because uh, of uh, the problem that this is a party that's under strict surveillance by public authority. So how do you do, how do you survey that party? Well, you send people in who give you information about what they're up to. And these people, in order to be authentically trustworthy by that party, produce lots of statements, which then in a case for banning that party, if you can identify that some of these statements have actually been made by people that the state has sent in, you have a problematic case. So they try again now, uh, and friends of mine are going to construct that uh, case, and I'm not sure it'll work, uh, because that structural problem is still there. And it's very hard to identify all the statements of that party, where they come from, who's responsible, and so on. So there are lots of uh, uh, pragmatic problems in banning parties, but also in banning speech, and so on. 
So seeing something as intolerable is, first of all, a question of our social attitude towards it. We should not accept it. We should deny it. We should criticize it. Whether we ban people by the law of saying things or doing, uh, of doing things is a, different, um, is a different matter. Is there a moral absolutism here? Well, there is a categorical imperative. Yes. Um, there is the imperative of always treating others as equal justificatory authorities, as what Kant or called as treating them as ends in themselves, which doesn't mean you know exactly how to treat them, but it means you better think twice at which actions or norms you can justifiably subject them to. And uh, one way of interpreting what it means to respect others as end them, ends in themselves in a Kantian scheme is to regard them as equal justificatory authorities. So you have a duty of justification towards them as equals in trying to find out what um, the appropriate norms between you should be. Is there an absolutism of the kind that if you go through that procedure of reciprocal and general justification properly, you will find the moral truth? No, that kind of absolutism between finite human beings cannot be had. My name is Sam Sumter. I'm a graduate student in philosophy. Um, so I, I guess I'm wondering, um, I guess this is in some ways echoing the first, um, the first person's question. Um, I'm, really, I'm really having a hard time sort of extracting, um, extracting the power from the dynamic of tolerance. Um, and I'm not, I guess I'm not totally clear on how, um, how we can get away with that, even with something like the respect conception, um, because it seems like any time a majority is, um, I guess, granting rights to a minority, it sort of comes with that baggage of the power. And I'm wondering how, if you could speak more to how the respect conception gets away from that. Right. Okay, well, there, there, there are a number of things to say. Thanks for this question. Um, the respect conception, really can't do away with power asymmetries in a society. It is rather a, ref a normative reflection on these power asymmetries. Um, and it, is, it should guide us in thinking about how in a democratic society we as citizens ought to respect each other. And it does ask majorities or minorities to respect e each other such that the rights we have as democratic citizens are not rights that a, major a majority grants a minority. This is not how we should think about it. it this is how it often is perceived, but that's a pre-democratic vision of what a democratic society is. And sometimes within democratic societies, people have a pre-democratic view of what they are up to. <laughs> It's not the case that the right for same-sex marriage, if it comes through, is a right that majorities grant minorities. It's a right that they ought to have as equal citizens. So it's a right they have a claim to, but not something they beg for or ask for, like a privilege. It's a, it's, it's, it's a right that they have given the constitution of a, democratic, of a democratic society. So there's a normative component which says that, you know, um, respect toleration means that we really regard each other as equals, disregarding whether someone is from a minority or a majority. But the reality which you point to is often very different. Uh, and that's why uh, th these are such complicated cases because there is, of course, an understanding of democracy. And that's why this was a talk not just about two conceptions of toleration. It was also a talk about two conceptions of democracy. There is an understanding of democracy which is majoritarian. It, it would justify citizens of a beautiful alpine country to ban minarets from 
being built. Is that democratic? Well, on a majoritarian understanding of democracy, yes. Is it democratic from a standpoint of democracy being an arrangement between equals who have equal rights to be respected in their identities? No, it isn't. It's deeply undemocratic. It's overpowering a minority because you stereotype what they're up to um, and you stigmatize it and you claim a privilege for a certain group uh, that really is an unjustifiable privilege and therefore falters on the reciprocity criterion and in that sense is undemocratic. But that's another debate. Some people say, how could it be undemocratic if it's an overwhelming majority that decides this? But then go back in history and look at the toleration debates. The cases where these are debates between roughly equal parties are very rare. The whole history is a history of minorities. And if you think democracy means to respect these minorities in, in, you know, in minimal ways, but then to push through your way of life um, um, such that they just have to conform, then I think you ought to think twice about your notion of democracy. Please. So I had a question, much like some of the other questions that have already, already been asked, I think that your distinction um, between the two types of tolerance has great potential for human rights first. But then I'm wondering uh, if in your opinion you only see uh, potential for this distinction between you know, toleration in the democratic context. And what does that say then, um, if, if, if the answer is yes, about um, non-democratic societies in which we're trying to embed and extend human rights, are we intolerant then of non-democracies? Right. right, okay, thank you very much. Um, it, it's, a very good, it's a very good question and I have not, I've not touched on it. When I say it's a democratic conception of toleration, I do mean that a society has to make room and has to in institutionalize a practice of justification where, what we th where the norms we think apply to all are really the product of mutual, of mutual justification, which is not always a happy and felicitous moment of agreeing. It's a lot of contestation and disagreement going on. Now, can, can such a notion of toleration also be possible in a non-democratic society? Well, as an attitude, towards respecting minorities, it could well be, but in a rather imperfect form because the, the basic structure of society is hierarchically ordered. So it's not ruled out that in social life there are spheres at which a, a majority does not push through its normative convictions overpower, overpowering minorities, but it would always be precarious because the, the non-democratic, if the non-democratic character of that society puts one majority into a dominant position, then it attempts to respect others as, as equals, will always be precarious and will always involve you know, power differentials which I think can only be overcome in a, in a democratic society. But I do not want to say that the spirit of respecting others as equals can only appear in democratic, in democratic societies. As much as in democratic societies, the spirit of hierarchy occasionally flourishes. Uh, in a non-democratic society in which there are strata of society which are not happy with the way things are regulated and have found ways of dealing with each other which are more egalitarian, that spirit of respect can well develop. But if the structure really doesn't, doesn't support it, if, if the basic institutions of society always give pri priority to one way of life, it's very difficult to, uh, to really change um, social life to in, 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 in the most important respect, say, of an educational scheme 
say, in terms of gender relations and so on. Please introduce yourself, yes, Jamie. Um, I'm Jamie Mayerfeld, and I teach in the Department of Political Science. And thank you for a wonderful talk. Uh, I'd like to think that the German Constitutional Court has been influenced and will continue to be influenced by your lucid arguments. Um, <laughs> Yeah, absolutely. They call yeah. me up every time. They Good. <laughs> I'm pleased to hear it. Um, so I just have a minor point because I think I pretty much agree with uh, everything you say, and it's a question about your understanding of toleration. And you seem to adopt a, a somewhat austere understanding of toleration where uh, you only tolerate something or tolerate somebody if at some level you disapprove of them or what they're doing. Um, but it seems to me, uh, but or let me just sort of sketch uh, a broader or looser understanding of toleration and ask you what you think about it, in which uh, coming to accept uh, differences can also be a move toward toleration. Um, so for, uh, as an example, think of um, attitudes towards gay people. So straight people who previously thought that it was wrong to be gay may, uh, through self-reflection, challenges, democratic discourse, justificatory practices, arrive at the view that it makes, that it's fine for gay people to lead gay lifestyles and it's fine for straight people to lead st straight uh, lifestyles. Um, so there's no longer any disapproval. Right. And I think, you know, that's broadly speaking is what's happening in many countries today. Now, for me, that seems like it's a movement toward greater toleration, greater tolerance. Um, so I just wanted to ask you whether what you thought about that looser uh, way of thinking about toleration. Thank you very much, uh, Jamie. It's been, been a pleasure being in your class, in your class uh, uh, today. So, yeah, what you describe as a movement towards greater toleration, for me, is a movement away from toleration. So it sounds like another paradox. Um, but in a way, I know what you mean. You describe a movement towards accepting plurality of ways of life as a movement towards toleration. But in fact, I think it isn't. It's a movement beyond toleration. Because if the objection component falls away, I'm no longer tolerant. I think, as you said, it's fine. So it's a movement toward greater pluralism, but not toward more toleration. Because I, only, I would only say I tolerate a way of life if I think there's something wrong with it. If I say, I accept that form of life, which is, you know, which, which I have no opinion about. It's not, it's, it's not right to say I tolerate it. It's just I accept it. I live, you know, it doesn't bother me. And so in, in, I, I know what you mean, and I don't want to be over fetishistic with the use of words. But really to say a society has moved towards greater tolerance, if it has achieved to move beyond certain objections that existed before, I think you're describing the situation in the wrong way. It has really moved beyond tolerance. And sometimes that is a great thing. Sometimes it is not. If, for example, we move to a society where racism or, or certain gender stereotypes wouldn't bother us anymore, that would not be progress. Um, so, so it always depends on the, on the content, but in fact, what you are saying is right. And, and in, in many societies, especially between Christian forms of faith, there have been movements beyond toleration because, you know, there were times not so long ago where um, the son of a Catholic family would you know, at the dinner table say that, you know, he would like to marry the daughter of a Protestant family. Um, there was not sheer happiness uh, 
um, as a result on uh, um, that night. Um, so it's not so long ago. Uh, and history of, of segregations and so on are, are very much with us. They're still our history and our, and our present. So, so these movements exist, yes, in, in certain parts of, of, of um, Western societies. This, the, now these kinds of intermarriages are not an issue anymore. Um, so yes, um, yes, it exists. Um, but we see in other, in other aspects of these societies that uh, um, a greater, uh, greater suspicion of, of Muslims uh, is it, it is rising uh, and anti-Semitism uh, in, um, um, in 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 various ways, also including Muslim anti-Semitism, is is rising. So so the overall the overall picture, I, I'm not sure is one of which you didn't say. I'm just you know babbling on. Um, uh, is may not be one of may may not be one of progress. It it really depends on the particular constellations in a society. And it's not, as, as, you know, as we all know, it's not just religion as a cause uh, that makes for certain conflicts. It's, it's overdetermined with social conflicts and, and, and political conflicts and all other issues. Uh, but, but really, sometimes a movement where you thought a society had moved beyond toleration sometimes moves back. Um, and sometimes, uh, um, and I think the, the uh, example of, of homosexuality is such an example. Sometimes you think, oh, this should really be not an issue anymore. And then a, a court decision comes along or a legislature, you know, uh, makes a certain law and, and there's an outcry uh, of people who thought, oh my God, this was, we, we thought this was long over. So We're going to keep the floor open until about 8.30 and We'll go to this side of the room. Thank you very, very much for a wonderfully stimulating talk. My name is Glennis Young. I'm a faculty member in history. Uh, so the title of your talk is Toleration and Democracy, and you began by stating that there was one concept of toleration, but multiple conceptions of toleration. I was wondering if you regard that statement as true with respect to democracy, uh, whether you consider democracy a concept and, and there are multiple conceptions also somehow historically of democracy and how you would weave in the same kind of historical and analytically philosophical approach to, to, to democracy as you did to toleration. Wow, thanks. <laughs> I wish I had a good answer to that and another big book to torture you with um, on democracy this time. Well, yeah, but, but you are, you know, you have in such an attractive way of asking the question that I'm, I'm, I'm tempted to say yes. I, I, think, I think that there's a, core, there's a core meaning of the term democracy, namely that those who are subject to the laws ought to be the authors of the laws in some for institutionalized form, not just in thought. So this, that's a loose definition, but I think, you know, a, a, a system in which those who are subject to the law could not in some institutionalized way have an influence, a co-determination of the laws, we wouldn't call democracy. So. So I think, I, yes, I would hold on to that core, but then say there are many conceptions of what, of how that concept was and is interpreted. But since you were so kind to say that you're a historian, um, I do know that there's a, there, there's a hesitation on the side of historians especially to fix one concept that would, you know, through the many ages, through the long ages in which such concepts develop and change, um, um, be identifiable as a core. And, and so here, yeah, I, I, I bite a certain platonic bullet. I think that uh, if we 
look at certain arrangements in antiquity and call them democratic. There has to be a core meaning to that term which we can identify and which relates that, what they have, to what we now regard as democratic. So I think the variation, the historical variation, if you have a good enough or, or a nuanced enough view of the conceptions that have changed and developed, I think the variation you could, you could capture by that. But if um, it was really true that we have two very different notions or concepts of democracy going on, it would be very difficult to argue why should we both, why should we call both of these things democracy? Um, you know, it's like comparing a, a, a car and a tree. What do they have in common? Why should we call uh, both of them with the same, with the same name? So I, I'm, I'm, yeah, I'm, 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 in a certain way, I'm, I'm a, I'm a, I'm believe in conceptual, in conceptual unity. Uh, but I hope the variation can, can uh, come in through the distinction of conceptions. But I, but I know that my, my book, for example, which reconstructs 2,000 years of toleration discourse, uh, historians of ideas have certain doubts whether it's still the same concept that we can identify from the early Christians, say, or who, who were using the term, or the Stoics, um, up um, until, until today. Well, that needs to be seen and, to, and could be a fruitful dialogue. We are going to take one more question, just one. Thank you. Sorry. Thanks for your talk. I'm Michelle. I'm from the philosophy department. Um, so you say in your conception of toleration that um, citizens have a basic right to justification according to reason. This is a really cool idea. The only thing, though, is that like toleration, as I'm sure you're aware, reason has a history, too. So when you say that citizens have a right to justification, reasons according to whom? That's my question. Yep. Well, <laughs> according to me. <laughs> the, the conception of reason um, I hold, and, and, and it is true that there are so many different ways, historical ways, uh, cultural ways, not to speak of how many different philosophies of reason there are and have been. Yes, it's, it's, a, it's a contested concept too. But the notion of reason I hold on to is the notion of reason that is self-reflexive. Reason is the capacity to question itself as Kant held. It is, you know, reason is, 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 the, is the combined faculties of each of us finite beings asking ourselves whether what we hold to be reasonable really is. So reason is that faculty which never rests with itself but has an inbuilt criticism of itself is what we regard as justifiable, truly justified. Yes. Every society produces languages of justification, which are often sealed, reified, hegemonic, one-dimensional. But it's only the, the language of justification which could break through and ask, really, is that justifiable? And to whom? And who is the agent of justification here? And what are the terms of justification? So I think. Reason, as the faculty of justification, has this inbuilt corrective mechanism. That, that shouldn't leave us, you know, resting happy and trusting reason as, as an independent source carrying us progressively into a Hegelian happy history. <laughs> uh, 